It took until the third round of the season for Jonathan France's Embassy Racing Team to reach the top step of the podium in the 2005 British GT Championship. Now they felt ready to start a serious challenge to the dominant Ferraris. Frogston was next up on the calendar. It's fast, sweeping curves around the airfield, quite a contrast to Knockhill's narrow, twisty and undulating circuit. Saturday morning's practice session was uneventful until just before the end when Ben Collins found that he couldn't take Church flat on old tyres. Apologies guys, I've spun at Church. The car is, is perfectly fine, just in a bit of grass here, I'll try and get back on. He was fortunate there was only minor damage. Practice gives you the chance of getting the car set up right. Jeff Kingston was more concerned about the TVRs than the Ferraris. While preparing the car for qualifying, the team found a damaged brake pipe and needed to replace it. Without a spare copper pipe bent to the right angles, they needed to improvise with a length of flexible braided hose. With qualifying scheduled for half past one, pressure was on to complete the work. Then, during the operation, the fire extinguisher was accidentally discharged twice. A bit tight for time, I think we can do it. Uh, the car's on the patch now, with its settings being uh, altered to suit qualifying, so uh, fingers crossed we'll have it ready. With 15 minutes to go, the car was ready to leave the awning. The mechanics were now working effectively as a team, whatever the obstacles thrown in their path. Qualifying proved unremarkable, except for the traffic. 20-odd slower GT3 cars spread around the circuit made it hard to find a clear lap. We didn't get quite the, uh, the best out of the car due to the traffic. Um, I think we're fairly happy with our relative performance compared to other 911s. Um, I would think we have a good car for the race, so we'll see. Yeah, we were fifth. It was very close to get um, third or fourth. I think if, we'd, if we could have been in that row, got a good chance of attacking the Ferraris in the first lap. Now we've got to get past the TVRs to have, a, have that chance. So it makes it just, you know, in order to get in their way, we needed to be a bit closer. Thruxton was special for Embassy. Last October's meeting had seen Ben partner Neil for the first time and their efforts gave the team its first podium. Jonathan was expecting the same again. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. We'd, we'd be disappointed with anything else, really. Um, we're certainly better than the fourth that we finished at, Thruxt, uh, at Knock Hill. And there's got to be a chink in that uh, Ferrari armour at some stage. Well, they're not invincible, are they? We, we proved that last time out and we'll be looking to do the same again. That chink showed earlier than expected. Chris Niarcos broke a drive shaft on the grid and one Ferrari was out before the start. His teammate Nathan Kinch led from pole position, followed by the two TVRs. In fourth, Neil Cunningham was keen to make up ground as soon as possible. On lap two, Neil was behind Patrick Pierce's TVR. He went for a move on the inside at Noble, but came off second best. The result of that contretemps was a punctured right rear, forcing Neil into the pits for a new tyre. The frustration showed as he tried to leave. The Ferrari armour disclosed another chink when Kinch spun under braking into the chicane on lap 7 and dropped behind the TVRs and Phil Keane's Mosler. After his enforced pit stop, Neil was ninth in class, 41 seconds behind the leader and with a convoy of GT3 cars to overtake as well. He could lap as fast as the leaders, but the traffic held him back. Prospects looked bleak until lap 11 when Gavin Kershaw spun his Mosler and the safety car was sent out. 
Once the field was bunched up, Neil was now up to sixth, just behind Mike Jordan, and only 17 seconds down on the leader. As it saves us about 40 seconds in actual track position. Although Neil was lapping sort of three or four seconds quicker than Mike Jordan, it would have taken him maybe seven, seven laps to make that gap up. So from six and then under a safety car, you've still got a chance at the podium. Absolutely. Depends how, how long we think the safety car might be out, dicti uh, dictate the uh, pit stop strategy for the driver change, and if that goes in our favour, podium's perfectly possible. Next time round, the pit window opened and it was safe to stop. Everyone in GT2 peeled off into the pits, except Neil. By the time he came in, the safety car was pulling off, so Ben would find himself back in eighth place when he rejoined and 40 seconds behind Jordan. Neil's explanation was simple. The radio went down um, we're on the first lap, so we had no radio, and I got turned up the TVR, and then um, just no radio contact. I thought we were going to go again for a couple more laps, but it's annoying. You know, we got our, I was sitting on Mike Jordan's uh, bumper, so I really felt that we could get up to about at least fourth again, get up to where the Ferrari was. Over the second half of the race, Ben flew in the Porsche, not able to reel in the leaders, but making up three places to finish an honourable fifth. I think everyone deserves better results than fifth at the moment, so hopefully we'll get um, get ourselves straightened out for tomorrow. Sort of a, you know, it's not too bad to start fifth and finish fifth, um, but it'd um, be much better to go forward and win, so see what we get tomorrow. The car's quick. We had the pace to win it today, but I think you could safely say we threw it away. We lost it. Sunday morning and the car returned from the warm-up on the end of a tow rope. Oil smoke was seen billowing out of the back, so Ben had been forced to park it on the circuit. So she blew off. She was not properly. It turned out to be just a loose oil filler cap. Not serious, but another little flaw in the smooth running of the team. Much like the fire extinguisher problem that had soaked the radio and stopped it working. The spare was now in place, but these small mistakes were having serious consequences. Fine weather at lunchtime as the start approached. What strategy then for the second Thruxton race? Well, obviously here there's a high chance of a safety car, so we'll probably run as long a first stint as we possibly can. Um, aiming to pit under under yellows, um, so we'll, we'll leave him out for the, the full 37 minutes. So we're starting from fifth, so we're going to try and put a really strong stint in and then um, either try and get in the lead or get it as close as I can for Neil to, to do the business in the second half. No problems for Ferrari this time, both cars on the front row ahead of the two TVRs. Ben was keen to make a good start as usual and pressurise those in front into mistakes. Into the complex on lap one, he muscled up alongside Warren Hughes in the TVR, but there was contact and both cars limped back to the pits for repairs. Rear body work, which is probably pudgy, yes, it's got its right rear tyre and wheel both damaged. So, obviously, the, the uh, wheel is flung off, the new tyre is, the new wheel is being put on the... As the embassy team got to work, so too did the TVR boys, double-checking the rear suspension after that impact. You never know where these things will lead. After Saturday's disappointments, this was just what the team didn't need. See better days. It took only 20 seconds to replace the wheel, but then rejoined a lap down and out of the points. From now on, it will be a struggle just to gain an extra place or two and hope others ahead hit trouble as well. In the event, it was Ben who was in more trouble. In after 15 minutes, stuck in sixth gear. Shane Dolan was under the car in no time, but sorting out the linkage was to take two and a half precious minutes. Let's keep going. Yeah, yeah we won't give up. Basically, it just you couldn't the, the lever will just keep on going forward and backwards at the time driving gear. So he got stuck in fifth after the nut had went so far, but we can get it on. And from there, Warren Hughes was also out of luck, retiring the TVR at the same time. How did he see the first lap clash? I mean, we had a problem at the start. I got hit up the rear uh, into the complex on the first lap, which obviously caused a puncture. Was that when the contact uh, with the Porsche, the embassy Porsche? I'm not sure which car it was, possibly. I just got hit from behind. After the driver change, Ben Collins offered a different perspective on the incident. 
Uh, it was a shame. I think Warren went slightly wide at the complex, and as he came back on, I was passing him. And uh, I don't think he knew I was there, so we touched. And that damaged both our wheels, so that was the end of it for both of us. Neil battled away three laps down for a thankless eighth in class and a solitary point as at Donington. Not the expected follow-up to the success in Scotland. Quickest car again on a consistent basis, but I think we'll get one point for being eighth in class. So. Yeah, we've had better weekends. Very character building, I think. I tried to win it yesterday on the second lap and I paid the penalty, so um, I think we always just need to buckle down and stretch the cars out a little bit. Like I say, we're still in touch, we're, we're not out of it yet. Um, go to Castle Coombe and hopefully try and get 20 on the board. Castle Coombe was four weeks off. Would that prove time enough for the team to get sorted? Coming to Castle Coombe, Ferrari was still dominant in the British GT Championship, having lost just one round in six. That was the lone embassy win in Scotland. But now Jonathan's team was struggling even to be best of the rest, lagging behind the TVRs and the other Porsche teams. During the long layoff, they had prepared thoroughly, replacing the flexible brake hose with permanent copper pipe and adding an extra silencer to either side to help conform to Castle Coombe's tight noise regulations. In the pit lane, there were signs of other teams' efforts to stifle exhausts. In first qualifying, Neil was back in the pits with smoke around the engine, just like at Thruxton. This time, it was oil dripping onto the exhaust. Nothing serious, but another distraction. Just before the end of the session, while way down in eighth, he returned with a more disturbing problem. Clutch has gone to the floor. No clutch. No clutch? No. Shane Dolan could see the problem under the bonnet just behind the brake reservoirs. This time the clip below the clutch fluid reservoir had come off and all the liquid drained away. With just 15 minutes between qualifying sessions, the mechanics earned their wages, including new chief mechanic Chris Coward. They had the car ready and set to go with just three minutes to spare. We've got a clutch back, yeah. In a professional racing team, everyone has a defined job and they stick to it. Ben Collins' job was to drive, and he did. Ignoring the car's problems, he went out and qualified in third, ahead of everyone but the Ferraris. They were a second or more faster. I think a Porsche could go any quicker than that around here. I thought, yeah, anyway. If the second race gave them a chance at a podium, Neil's qualifying problems made it unlikely in the first. My qualifying wasn't so well. Um, we had a bit of an oil leak, and um, on my third, I oh, started my fourth lap, and so I had to come back into the pits to sort that out. And I went back out for my next run for good qualifying time, and the clutch pedal went down. But it didn't just go loose, it went up into the bulkhead, so you got nothing there at all, it's very unusual. I'd rather the clutch than the brake pedal got there, but it, uh, you had to pit. So what I decided to do was pit early, give Ben the, the mechanics to work on Ben's car for him, and uh, so he can at least have a clutch when he goes out. I'm really happy that um, I set my best time today, uh, it's quicker than what I've done this morning, and it's uh, our best qualifying position o over the season, so it was, it was a good lap, and I'm pleased to bring it back in one bit. OK, so give us a prediction for this weekend. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed, and I'll be happy with a third place for this race, and then tomorrow we'll just, you know, hopefully get a second or maybe a win tomorrow. But I think with the luck we've both had, I think we just want to get on the podium today. <laughs> third will be fine at the moment. By the time of the first race, late in the afternoon, the rumours flying around the paddock were confirmed. Lawrence Tomlinson had withdrawn his two TVRs, partly as they'd struggled to meet the noise regulations, and partly for political reasons. It may have diminished the series, but Neil moved two places up the grid to sixth. And that soon became fifth when David Jones dropped his Porsche on the formation lap trying to warm up his tyres. The good fortune continued once the lights turned green. The race may last an hour, but it's driven like a sprint, and Chris Arcos spun at Camp Corner on lap three, giving fourth place to Neil. Two laps later, Phil Keane took to the grass in the Mosler after taking the lead, and Neil was up to third. 
The Mosler dropped half a minute, pitting to clear grass from the air intakes and wasn't to figure again. By the time the pit stop window was open, Neil was seven seconds down on Nathan Kinch in the leading Ferrari, with Chris Niarcos in the other one five seconds behind him. Mike Jordan held second. The Ferraris pitted early, letting Jordan lead for a while until he handed over to Michael Caine. Neil stayed out for another three laps, and after a quick changeover, Ben found himself in second place in a Ferrari sandwich. Neil's great run counterbalanced the disappointment of Thruxton. What were the lead cars doing against me? You were about the quickest out there when the field went down a bit. All right. Now it was Ben's turn. He wouldn't expect to catch Andrew Cocotti, but could he hold Tim Mullen back over the last 25 minutes? It took most of that time for Tim to find a way past, but in the end, Ben settled for third, the podium that they had thought possible, if unlikely. After qualifying eighth, it was a great result and a true team effort. Yeah, we can regroup for tomorrow. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> what a funny old race. It was, was it? Yeah. So they finished on Saturday, where they would start on Sunday. And this time, Ben was the lead driver. It would be pretty boring if we finished behind the Ferraris again. So starting that much closer, that gives me you know, a chance to get amongst them on the first laps and um, you know, push, push like mad and hand over to Neil in a strong position so he can try and beat the other two as well. <laughs> Jonathan was more modest in his ambitions. He could see a way of at least beating everyone but the Ferraris. If we could finish every race in third place from now on, that would probably be the, the best we could hope for. Um, there might be the odd time where circumstances play into our hands and we'd have a, a first or a second, but I don't think it's unrealistic to be on the podium in all the remaining races. With the council's sensitivity about noise, there were more tests on Sunday morning. The embassy car registered 108 decibels in the static test against a limit of 114. Both Ferraris were much closer to the limit, with the Niarcos and Mullen car failing on the Sunday morning. The team repacked the silencers and hoped the car wouldn't fail the trackside limit of 106 decibels that caused the TVR to be black flagged on Saturday. At lunchtime on Sunday, hundreds of VIPs and team guests swarmed around the cars on the grid, and the expectations were high for a memorable race. Castle Coombe is a fast track, even with the new chicanes, and the drivers reckon it's great for racing. As usual, the circuit had attracted an excellent crowd and the good weather to go with it. Ben Collins had nailed his colours to the mast. He had to take at least one Ferrari on the first lap. Down into Folly, he squeezed alongside Tim Mullen in the number 34 car and held the position up the hill and over Avon Rise. That put him on the inside line into Quarry, and the Porsche was second. First job done. Behind them, Godfrey Jones in the black and silver Porsche made a great move through Quarry to get ahead of teammate Michael Kane in the white Porsche and then held him back for the whole of the first stint. Ben fought to hang on to second, but the inevitable happened after five laps. Tim demonstrated the Ferrari's superior power when he forged ahead out of quarry to chase after his teammate. It now looked as if Jonathan France would have to settle for another third place. But as so often happens in GT racing, the safety car intervened to shuffle the pack and challenge the team's strategists. Steve Wood outbraked himself into tower and the stewards deployed the safety car while the car was removed to a safe place. It was just at the time that Jeff Kingston brought Ben in to hand over to Neil. This was one lap ahead of their rivals, the Ferraris and the Kane and Jordan Porsche. It meant that by the time everyone had changed, Neil was in the lead, now just ahead of Nathan Kinch. Ben Collins knew he had a fight on his hands. Yeah, it'd be very hard for him as it was for me to fend off the Ferrari, but you know, Neil's the best. Neil is the best driver on the track. At the... He's the best driver on the track at the moment. So um, you know, I've got I've got a lot of faith in him that he can hang on. The pair circulated nose to tail for 12 laps, but with 15 minutes still to go, Kinch made his move. 
Nathan nosed up alongside Neil into tower and then held his line right through the corner and up towards Bobby's chicane. Neil had to back off. Except that he didn't do so early enough and was forced to take to the grass. Back on the tarmac, he was still in touch and the other Ferrari was 10 seconds adrift in third. Ben was clearly devastated, but as far as Jonathan was concerned, second place would be good enough. Then came the message over the radio, engine temperature rising. Neil needed to stop. The reason was obvious from the track side. The air intakes were completely blocked by grass, just like the Moslers had been earlier. It only took three seconds to clear the grass from the air intakes, but the unscheduled pit stop put them down to fifth. By the flag, Neil had passed the Jones Brothers Porsche to make it up to fourth, but it was small consolation for him or the team. Jonathan knew they should have done better. I'd, I'd expressly said to both drivers before the start of the race, third place is good enough. We're starting third. If we finish less than third, I won't be happy. And too true, I'm not happy. If you know, we're good enough to um, maybe won that race, or, you know, at least second today. But uh, you know, it was a mistake. He was should have gave it up a bit earlier. Certainly Ben drove a fantastic race today, got the car in a, in a position it shouldn't really have been in, excellent pit work from the guys, and we throw it away. Uh, it's not what we're here for. So as the racing instinct overtook uh, discretion? Yeah, I, I, I didn't want to finish second, I, I wanted to win. It was a frustrating end to a good meeting, but next up later in July was the Spa 24-hour race. It wasn't part of the British Championship, but Jonathan saw it as a good testing ground for the team's abilities. You know, I don't know really yet how much we've bitten off, but we'll, we'll soon find out. But the, the car that wins that will be the one that spends least time in the pits. You don't necessarily have to be out and out quickest. Um, it's tortoise and the hare. And I believe there's something else we have to congratulate you about. You're going to become a father. That's right, yes. Yeah, I had some good news this week that uh, Kate's expecting our, our first child. Yes. So overall, it looks like 2005 could be quite a good season. Mm, yeah, and, and 2006, the prospects are looking quite good as well.